Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. We're not in Kansas anymore is the theme of today's discussion with Scott and Bill Minahan, who runs the Badgett Playhouse in Grand Rivers, Kentucky. From Kansas to Branson to Savannah, Georgia, and now Kentucky, Bill has a fun and entertaining story to tell about his life in show business. He also talks about his nonprofit work in Guatemala. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, where every week we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee, just like we do every single day here at our museum and Heritage Park in Union City. My guest today is Bill Minahan, the big kahuna... (laughs) At Paget Playhouse in Grand Rivers, Kentucky. Wow, I'm a Kahuna. You are a big Kahuna. A, oh, a big Kahuna. Absolutely. I've, I've been called a lot of things. Never that. I'm I'm honored. You have to come to Discovery Park to become a <laughs> big Kahuna. Everything's bigger here at Discovery Park. Exactly. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about where Little Bill started out. Little Bill. <laughs> Little Bill, all the way back in Kentucky, <laughs> in Missouri, in wherever. Where, tell me about where Little Bill started off. Where are you from? Kansas, Topeka, Kansas. Kansas. Mm-hmm. So you yes. get to do that joke. We're not in Kansas. We're anymore. not in Kansas anymore. I, yeah, yeah, and you know it's funny. I I love. I'm I'm going to tie everything back into Discovery Park because I love your um your tornado thing, and so and I'm watching that, and just when that first scene comes up and the and the thing, and you're like, that's home, you know. <laughs> and I've never <laughs> seen a tornado, but oh, wow. I have been. Almost in about a million of them. Wow. My whole I've, I've lived in Kansas, you know, my whole growing up life. Never saw a tornado. But when that first scene comes up in, in your movie here, it's like, oh, the way the wind changes and you can feel it in the air. And I remember my mom standing. Um, we almost saw a tornado one time. She was standing at the front door. And you know how it gets real calm right before the tornado. And I heard her go, oh, my gosh. And like I'll never forget. And so, any when that video plays and that comes up, I just remember my mom standing at the front door, going, "Oh, here it comes!" You know. Wow. And it it never came. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so so much in the fact that my son, when we came back this time, he's like, "Can we watch the tornado one again?" Oh, good. Yeah. That, so that's good. So we've seen tornado yeah. twice. We've seen the um, ice age once, and I'm sure we'll see that again. But yeah. we we love it here. So. Does he like the earthquake? You know, he can actually experience the ground move in the simulator. That. We're we're working up to that. He's yeah. seven. He's seven, seven okay. and he's he's working into he very he internalizes things and takes everything real seriously and like that'll he'll work that into a dream and then tell me about it the next like well this happened in my you know whatever so yeah. um we haven't quite done that yet but like when we go to Holiday World you know we're every year we graduate to the next layer of rides and excitement or whatever and we yeah that one just hasn't we haven't crossed that bridge yet <laughs> now let's go back to seven-year-old bill sorry sorry <laughs> now so so with seven-year-old bill um you're clearly you're a successful entertainer now we're going to talk all about that in a minute clearly <laughs> clearly otherwise you wouldn't be at real foot forward podcast because we go. only there. have successful okay, entertainers good, here. good good so you um, were you in theater? Were you a singer? Were your parents, you know, encouraging you to perform? What What was the genesis of your? Uh, where was the Where was the entertainment seed planted? Well, I remember it's It's funny now because I I call myself I'm making air quotes um, a producer. You know, we produce shows of the Badger or whatever. And the first show that I produced was in my living room, and it was Three Little Pigs, mm-hmm. and I had my mom and my brother and my sister as the performers, you know, and I gave them little, they, I made little, you know, masks for them to hold up. Okay. You're the pig. Now you do this. And now you did it. And I, as the, the show started, I, I kept saying, I can't believe they're actually doing it. Like I told them to do this and to say these lines and they're doing it. And that blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And so now to this day, um, I look up on stage, you know, we've got a horn section, we've got uh, singers and everyone has, you know, real resumes, real, you know, you know, Terry Mike Jeffrey that we've talked about. These are all like legit real time, big time performers. And I'm like, wow, 
they're doing what I told them to. I mean, that's just a, it's a, it's a crazy concept, you know, and we've, we've, provo- I don't know, we produced, I don't know, probably 30 different types of shows there. And we do about 175 live performances a year. So, I mean, just the, the fact that it even happens is still amazing to me almost every time it happens. And, and there is a thrill to, to helping to put all that together and then to see the audience really loving right. what they're doing. Right. You know, so yeah, the, I, I definitely know what you're talking about. Well, and, and, you know, I know your story somewhat too, but you, you've probably been in the trenches and then as you kind of get farther back in, you know, to the 30,000 feet view of things, my concern was always, will I still have the same, like, will that still grab me and motivate me the way it, it was? And as I started to step out of the performing and was just into the creating and the producing, it, it definitely did as much as, and now that I'm older, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's even more. So I would rather just create and produce and not even be seen, you know, and I don't do, I do probably half the shows now. And if there's some that I can lay out of, I just, you know, I just don't or whatever. Yeah. And we also have, you know, two small children that we're trying to, you know, we, we got started late in life with that too. So now does your, does your wife perform as well? She does. She's okay. also a performer. She does all the choreography. She does. She she makes all the costumes. She has a a degree in theater from Indiana University. So she's the she's the educated one. I I kind of backed into it. So 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 let's let's back up to to uh, <laughs> still back to, to little Bill to, sorry. to little Bill. Yeah. So you uh, when was your first you know high school theater or when was your first uh, experience of like really putting on a show? Right. Well, you know. That all kind of laid dormant for a while, and my family was your typical sports family, and you know they they always encouraged me to do whatever, but there was never any like you're going to be in shows someday, or you're going to. I mean, I'm the complete opposite of anything anyone else in my family in terms of what I do, but they completely support me at the same time. Um, in the eighth grade, my mom said they're having um, auditions at a local community theater for Oliver Twist, and you're going. Okay, there and I go. said okay, what will that entail? And she said, well, you'll go in and you'll read the lines and whatever. And, and she said, you know, and it's a musical. Now, what what made her know to do that? No idea. Huh, that's interesting. And I mean, and I and I tell her, you know, and there, there's a funny, there's a funny end note to, to, to her making me do that that happened, you know, a few years ago. But um, <laughs> so I, I go in and I, she just said, you, you just need to do this. I mean, I guess apparently I was a bit of a, of a ham. No. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. What? She may have seen that. She may have looked <laughs> through the layers and, and saw that there in there go. somewhere. Hiding, Hiding down in there. Yeah. yeah. But she said, you're going to go. And I mean, not like, would you like to? Do you think that might be something you'd like to do? And she's like, you're going to go do this. And I was like, okay. And she said, you know, you just all you have to do is go in and do it. And I said, fine. If they make me sing, I will not do that. I won't even, I mean, I'd never even like heard myself sing. You and know? you were how old? Eighth grade, eighth grade. Whatever okay, that, yeah, whatever. that's a that's a uh, yeah, that's a pretty tough year. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. And so now I'm being thrust into this whole other world. So I go in and I they said um, you know audition for it, and I got the part of the Artful Dodger, which is like this <laughs> Oliver Twist, and then the Artful Dodger, whatever. Uh-huh. And and I and I sang. They said sing, and I sang, and it was you know enough that we got. I got the part or whatever. And I'll never forget, they pulled us into the room and they said, this this is Oliver Twist and this is the Artful Dodger. <laughs> and and they applauded for me. The people, the other actors applauded for me. And that's the first applause I'd ever gotten. And I will never forget that particular moment of uh-huh. applause. I mean, I've, I've hopefully had a few since then, but, you know, so. Um, but yeah, she made me do that. and And then it was pretty much, that was the trajectory from there on out. I mean, I still did sports and different things like that, but I knew... There was something else that was going to go, you know, kind of that way or whatever. And then did your high school offer theater and... They did. By that time, I was pretty well in it fully, you know, or whatever. Um, and it was a, one of those deals where it was a big enough high school where they'd say, you kind of have to choose. You, can, you can't really do both. You have to either do the theater or the sports. And sports was okay, but I kind of... My brother was big into sports and we were kind of known as a sports family. And I was like, oh, and then there's that theater kid, you know, that's going to do theater or whatever. How so, many siblings? Just... Uh, one brother, one sister. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, and everybody's athletic, Friday Night Lights. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, my sister's the homecoming queen. My brother's the starting quarterback. And then there's Bill, who's the artful dodger or whatever, you know, <laughs> so... And what town is this? Uh, Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Topeka, Kansas. Topeka. You're still in Topeka. Still in Topeka at this okay. point. Yep. yep. Okay. And now, now at some point, you, you did you go to an institution of higher learning? I did. I went to Manhattan Christian College okay. in Manhattan, Kansas. 
uh, right across the street from Kansas State University. But you just tell people you went to school in Manhattan. I did, yeah. And I we were called the Little Apple, but I just say, yeah, well, I went to school in Manhattan. And mm-hmm. then, you know, we had – there was – 300 kids in our college, if you can believe that, you know, I mean, it was a tiny little college that basically was training people for the ministry. And so here I was at that point, I had started doing magic shows. And so that happened somewhere in there too, to where by the time I got out of, you know, out of college or out of high school, rather into college, I was, that was kind of my, my thing. I was performing and doing some other things, but I was mainly like, I'm going to be a I want to be a magician. I want to be, that's what I'm going to do. So you really kind of had that as sort of your visionary end goal. Oh was yeah. Magic. Magic. Which is intense. I mean, magicians are intense and there's, you know, right. societies and, right. and they're, uh, but this was more kind of, if you can imagine kind of a g- goofy magic, like I called it comedy magic. So it was like, you know, the, you know, the Steve Martin thing where he had, you guys are too young to remember this, the other people here, but uh, he had the arrow through the head, you know, so I had sure. the magic wand through the head. Yeah, I'm too, what do you mean? I'm not too young? No, I mean, no, you, and you as well. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. as well are too young. I forgot no, to mention. No, I remember that well. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of where I, I wanted to go. And it was kind of one of those, you know, as we all have in our life, those watershed moments where you're like, well... I'm standing here at this crossroads and I kind of got these things in my backpack and one of them being I do this magic thing and I want to do this. I also wanted to be involved in some sort of ministry or something. Um, I'm at a college where a bunch of people are training to be ministers. I don't really want to do that. I don't think I'm that guy. Um, I wonder how this is all going to work out, you know. So Oh, sure. And and there I was, you know. So And then after all that, saying I wasn't a sports guy then because I was tall and could like run people over they asked me to be on the basketball team so I played I played collegiate basketball even though I hadn't played since like you know ninth grade but you could have combined the two made like the basketball disappear right yeah exactly oh what yeah yeah. and make everybody laugh I I made my talent disappear because I was not I was not good (laughs) (laughs) I was not good at all like well you're you're tall right you know one of those uh, stereotype things that just aren't true like well you're tall you can play basketball it's like yeah yeah no that doesn't always uh, add up but I could I could run people over. I was big and I could like, you know, like get in the way of things. That was something I was good at. And so you, um, you met your wife around this time? I met my wife uh, uh, by, I, after college went to Branson, Missouri and was there for, from 95 ish to 99 ish. And then went to Mackinac city, Michigan, Mm -hmm. um, to not not to the island, but to a little city called Mackinac City, which is right the the jumping off point for the island, and we met doing a show there. So I went uh, with the production company up there. That was when I was like, okay, I'm gonna be the well, what was called the company manager, which is basically like the producer under the under the producer, or at least that was the the vernacular in in the Branson days. And so I was producing or company managing that show as well as per- performing in it. And then walks in my wife, you know, to the the first meeting of all the cast. And I was like, oh, we have a, we have a new girl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess I'll help her if she needs anything with, uh, you know, anything at all. So um, within a couple of weeks we were dating and, you know, never looked back or whatever. So, so, th- so the, the Branson year, I'm fascinated by Branson. Yeah. So I've been many times, you know, yeah. for business and, yeah. and, you know, for pleasure, but right, right. Um, I've, I've always been fascinated by this small small rural community yeah. that had entertainment, yep. you know, that yep. just sort of organically grew. Because Branson's right. honestly not hard, not easy to get to. get to, to right. You know, it's hard to get to. And it's, it's, it was really hard back then. I mean, it was like a one, like 65 highway was a was a two lane road to get there, you know, up and down. And now there's an actual highway that gets there. But I was fascinated because uh, um, I had, you know, professional meetings. There. I was fascinated by the culture. Mm-hmm. So you have mm-hmm. all these people producing these shows mm-hmm. and then you have all these artists, you mm-hmm. know, who performers, dance dancers, right. singers, entertainers, right. Right. and they're trying to have a life right. in this rural mountain community. Right. I mean, it's right. an amazing, uh, at least it was, it's been a number of years since I've been there, but right. it's an right. amazing uh, culture there of just people. It shouldn't, it's something that shouldn't exist by all intents and purposes. I mean, it, it just, it shouldn't be, but it is. It's almost like a, you know, I, I mean, I, there are people, I've left there probably so like, you know, my last show there would have been like in 2000 or 2001, something like that. There are still good friends of mine that are still there to this day, 19 years later, doing a show every single day of the week. That's remarkable. Or, or every single, you know I mean? Like yeah. maybe five, 
sometimes six, seven, you know, I mean, we're all Facebook friends. And so you kind of see, oh, I'm in such and such show. And I'm like, wow, you are still doing the same. And some of them doing the same show, you know? Did you see that uh, reality show about Branson that was on not too long ago? Yes, the the Brady guy. Yeah. um, That guy is... A guy that I was in a show with is friends with which whichever Brady that Greg, yeah. Greg I don't know his real name or whatever, but yeah. you know it's like it's very surreal to sit back and and watch all that happening and like Branson is this thing that people go to and they, you know, guys even famous people like that and it, it's it's very strange. I mean, having said that, I was just telling my wife yesterday, like I feel like Branson is my hometown. Like if mm. I you know I speak as where I'm from or whatever, but if I were gonna go back to my quote unquote hometown, it almost feels like Branson, even That's though I've only, it, it yeah. is. And I don't, I yeah. don't have a reason for that because I mean, everyone there is so transient. I mean, right. we were, we were joking around, you know, because we're not from where we're living now and everyone else is where well, in the converse of that is when you're in Branson, like, wow, you were born here. Like no one's from there. Right. You know, no right. one's, when we lived in Savannah for a couple of years, no one like was from there. They, they moved there for something. And so like my wife and I moved to where we're at now and they're like, wait, you moved here for this? You know, like, well, yeah, that's what you do. You know, we moved here to do our thing and, and here we are or whatever. So, but I remember my first year of Branson, I was driving home, you know, we're talking two shows a day, mm-hmm. you know, two high intense, like jumping around, dancing, singing crazy stuff for two hours a day, two of those every day, six days a week. And I remember driving home going, well, I have, I have reached the pinnacle. I mean, I'm in a show in Branson and that's all I could even conceive of as wanting or whatever. And I was driving home after a couple months. And I was like, wow, I don't like this. Oh. This is, this is, yeah. this is not what I, this is not what the brochure promised. You know, it's like, I, and what shows were you in? Um, I was in a show called at the hop okay. and I was in a show called uh, lost in the fifties, which was kind of mm-hmm. the bigger one that I was in. Yeah. Uh, and that's the one that we actually kind of, well, franchise for lack of a better word and took up to Mackinac city and then out eventually to Savannah, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did some stuff with silver dollar city and some different things, but I was really in the same show or same kind of show for most of my time, which was, you know, most people bounced around a lot more. Um, but I was just in those particular shows and I, and I liked it. I mean, I, I think back fondly of those times and it was like, I, you know, you didn't know how good you had it. All you had to do is get up in the morning and go do a show and then go home and go back and do a show. And it was, it was great. I loved it, but it was a very odd, uh, world, you know? And like you're saying, it's when you go there and visit, you're just kind of amazed by like, wow, this is just, this is just this reality here. You know, these, all these shows, um, they said a couple of years ago, they said, we have over a hundred shows a day in Branson. And I was like, Oh, well, that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> right, yeah, sure. cause sure. I've been in plenty of shows where, you know, watching or being in them where more people on stage than there were in the audience. Right. right. And I went out one time, there was literally, um, I remember being in one show and there were, there were six people in the audience. Yeah. And I, and I went to the producer and I was like, well, we're not doing the show. He goes, we absolutely are. He goes, you're paid to do X amount of shows a week. Yeah. And those people paid their money. We're not canceling a show. Get out there and do the show. And, and, and then two of them were like friends of mine that were like there for free or whatever. And I was yeah. like, oh my goodness. It's a very intimate performance. Very, very yeah. intimate. Very <laughs> intimate. Which has been hard just to kind of add to that, which has been hard over the years. There's a Branson mentality or a Grant Branson concept of what we're doing in Grand Rivers. However, I, even to this day, I have to realize some of those paradigms don't exactly jive. I mean, like we don't need to do a show for six people there. We need to make sure that what we're doing there makes financial sense and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so there's been some of that and you're judged by, well, this theater does 20 shows a week. Oh, that's, they're successful. Well, less is more. So, I mean, we've learned over the years that sometimes it's better to do t- uh, one show with 200 people than two shows with 100 people. Yeah. No, that you makes know, total sense. It, it, there's a, there's a math thing there with the, with the financial aspect, but then there's just the mentality of like, it has to be something that for us is still special. I mean, we need to feel that like, oh, this is exciting. Cause when you get into that two shows a day, six days a week, blah, 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 blah. It, 
it gets everyone does that. I mean, you know, in no matter what show, big or little. And so that's just something that we've had to combat all these years. We do a lot of different shows and we don't do as many shows. And I think that's been one little secret to our longevity. That's been one thing where we've had to kind of separate ourselves from the, what I call the Branson model. So anyway. So the, the other thing about Branson that's interesting, you know, it's similar to Vegas, except there's no gambling. So right. the entertainment is right. actually, is it. in Vegas, the entertainment is sort of the, the lure. to get you to come in and gamble. <laughs> right, right. In, in Branson, maybe eat, you know, like right. there's a lot of buffets. And, right. But, you know, so the entertainment right. is the thing. Right. So I love the idea and the concept of a small rural community Mm -hmm. providing entertainment, obviously with us here at Discovery Park of America, Mm -hmm. something like what you have Mm -hmm. um, currently going on, which we're going to talk about, Mm -hmm. you know, is so enticing Mm -hmm. and is so much, you know, we need to work to make it part of the overall Mm -hmm. Discovery Park experience. Because you're, how long did it take you to get here this morning? 45 minutes. Yes. So so you're really close to us. Oh yeah, absolutely. So what, what, so you and your wife, you were entertaining, you Mm -hmm. were, you know, having a life, Mm -hmm. you know, as entertainers. Yep. What made you, uh, what was the path to the Paget Playhouse? You know, as, I, as I'm as i driving home that time telling you that I didn't like what I was doing that particular time, my mind had always been that I will have my own show someday. And I didn't know if that meant the Bill Minahan show. I mean, I, I, I see now in the big picture, like, it's just a show that I have the creative creation control over. That was my goal at the time, whether I realized it or not, you know, um, because as I don't want to put my name in lights, we don't, you know, we don't say the Bill and Sarah Minahan show brought to you by Bill and Sarah, you know, we don't, our name, if you look on our website, you won't find my name or my wife's name anywhere on there. Maybe, I don't know, maybe somewhere I say that someone's going to go look, but, but I mean, we're not, it's not about our production company. You don't hear the name Minahan Productions or whatever. I mean, that's just not what we're about or whatever. It's more about creating a good product or whatever. Oop. I just bumped it. Uh-oh. The tech, the tech crew is upset. I just bumped the mic. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I've been bumping it the whole yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Well, pow. Um, but um, so that was always the the plan. And and that definitely took baby steps. I mean, when we um, when I was started to kind of do the company manager thing, I was in charge, quote unquote, of a bunch of performers, which is a lot like herding cats. And it doesn't get any easier the older you get or whatever. Um, so, but we, we, you know, I would, when we went up to Michigan, the producer would leave, of course. So then I would kind of manage the show after that. And then we started talking about, well, let's, let's have our own show together. Let's all own a show. Let's all, you know, so, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we knew what the concept was, you know, you want a place where family entertainment, where there's quote unquote, nothing to do at night. That's sort of the, the the mantra. And so we looked everywhere. And when I say everywhere, everywhere. I mean, we looked in Colorado. We looked in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. We went out to, um, uh, oh, you know, uh, what's the name of the town? A couple of little ski towns out in Colorado. We looked we looked at three or four different ski towns out in Colorado. Um, you know, at one point we were seriously considering putting it in a, at a former gas station in Colorado. And I'll never forget what my, who was the producer at that time, you know, when business partner, or whatever, he said, you know, y- you're going to not really care what you're, I mean, you're not going to like yourself driving to work every day. I'll never forget him saying that. He goes, you got to like what you're driving up to every day. And he goes, and if you're doing a show in a gas station in Colorado, I don't know if you're going to like that. And I was like, you know, and, and that honestly, that bit of advice has helped me with everything. You know, if I, inv- I invest in some real estate and it's like, if I can drive up to that piece of property and I like driving up to it and I, and I think about him saying that every time, you yeah. know, you know, like you gotta like driving up to it, you right. know, so, which is the opposite of what you were having in Branson. You know, it, you didn't like what you were doing. Didn't like it. Didn't like driving there. Didn't like driving home. Didn't, you know, any of that stuff. So anyway, um, we looked and looked and looked. They said there is a theater in Savannah, Georgia, and it's it's open. I mean, it's working, but it's a kind of a dump or whatever. So we went out there and looked, and you know, we were in the middle of a of a ro- of a tour actually. Um, after we had finished the Mackinac contract, we did a little short tour, and we're like, okay, if we can't get this together, we're just going to go back and work at Branson. That's fine. So we go out there, and we find this theater, and it's I mean, it's still operating to this day. I mean, I'm still a, a business partner with them, you know, eighteen point three percent, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, we we started it, and it went really really well. Like it was just, it was the the right thing at the right time. Um, you know, kind of like you're saying, what's the, what's the draw at night? You know, it's, it obviously wasn't gambling. Um, we, we didn't serve alcohol 
or we didn't at the time. I think they might serve wine or something now. And Savannah is a good tour and travel market. I mean, right. A lot of people visit Savannah. Right. Yeah, just the sheer numbers. I mean, yeah. and that that is a challenge that we have. I and mean, we don't have the numbers of a Savannah or whatever. But, but yeah, I mean, they're right. Okay, so, um, you know, beginning of Forrest Gump, the feather is floating down or whatever. That's called Chippewa Square. That's the theater. That's where the theater is sitting in that square. And if you watch the, if you if you freeze frame the uh, the feather at one point, you can see the little tiny corner hmm. of of our theater. Okay, you know, so nice. it's like we're we're in Forrest Gump. I yeah. mean, you just got to look really Absolutely. close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, where that bench was is a flower bed now, because of course, as you can imagine, everybody and their dog was sitting at that bench and this and that and the other. So yeah. Anyway, so. We were out there for about a year and a half. I mean, it was a long way from home. Uh, my wife is from Princeton, Indiana. So, I mean, you know, this is home is in the general vicinity. And uh, I don't know, you know, what are we going to do? So we, we just, we heard someone say there's a place called Grand Rivers and there's a restaurant called Patty's and it's really cool, but there's nothing to do there at night. And the nothing to do there at night should be, say, you know, with families, you know, I mean, there's obviously, but like, for example, Savannah, there's something to do there at night, not necessarily for families, Branson, whatever. So that's sort of the mindset, nothing to do there at night. And this is Grand Rivers, uh, Kentucky. Kentucky, right. Um, and Patty's, you might explain, because because I honestly, as I'm driving to Paducah or as I'm driving to Nashville around through Kentucky, right. I pass that? that, I pass through, it says Patty's 1880 18... settlement. Uh, yeah. And, is it, and what I'm is like that? thinking that must be like a tourist attraction of an exactly. old cabin. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I've never been. Right. And so, right. uh, you know, and I understand there was a fire. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about Patty's. Right. Well, I mean, Patty's is is an, another one of these things that's just it's almost like a miraculous thing in the middle. I mean, we're really in the middle of nowhere. There, a town of three hundred people, and and here's Patty's. You know, you've got two unbelievable world class marinas on either side, and then you got Patty's in the middle. I mean, I I don't. I'm probably going to quote these numbers wrong, but I think they do like several. You know, a, a, over a million people a year go through there and eat, and it's like so. We go in there and we're like, well, yeah, this would make perfect sense you know i mean there's patties and there's nothing to do at night and yet there's buses lining up to get in there you know so they do a big bus business and is it from paducah or where's most of the feeder markets for it's really all over um but what we're finding or what we have found over the years is people really like the um the day trip Mm. they want to come in they want to eat at patties at noon they want to go to our 2 p.m matinee and then they want to get out of town Mm. and is that an older demographic typically on a a bus mm -hmm, that's a baby boomer generation which is going to be you know an aside to that is it's going to be a challenge for us going forward because the bus group is as you know is a certain is a certain animal i mean it's not you don't see 35 year old people on buses right right the the the, uh, whole industry is definitely changing and shifting right so you guys went you at patties yeah um and you said these people need a theater these guys need a theater yeah so let's do this okay so so we we went to the tourism and they're just like yeah yeah that's great okay that'll that's yeah let's definitely think about that or whatever and then nothing you know but then the guy said well what you ought to do mm-hmm. you ought to go to paducah because they got a couple of old theaters there that need to be renovated well, there you go, because we had just renovated the Savannah Theater. I'm like, oh, well, we know what we're doing there. Da, da, da. You know, we renovated that whole theater for $150,000. Well, we didn't we didn't renovate it. We got it, the dust knocked off, and we got, you know, the, the curtains cleaned, and we got the show going. But all be that as it may. So we go to um, we go to Paducah, and, you know, we do the normal thing where we call the numbers, and we get inside this, you know, the Columbia Theater downtown, and folks from around here would probably know, I mean – unbelievable place that unfortunately is still sitting there in the same mm. situation that we saw it 20 years ago or whatever. So if anybody's listening and they want to follow in your footsteps, <laughs> exactly. they should go to Paducah. Yeah, if you want to follow my footsteps, don't because it is a hard life. <laughs> it's a hard knock life. It really is a hard knock life as the, as the saying goes, as the musical says. Yeah. I'm the few, when they invite me out to those career days, you know, like, would you come speak about, I'm like, I'm the one person that's like, don't do this. Get, go to college and get a job and don't just sing at church. That's all you need to do. And you'll be fine. You'll get your joy out of that. So, so, um, but anyway, so, so we go and we're literally, again, we're back at that crossroads. Like we've got, okay, all right. We have this desire to do this. Um, we want to be closer to home, blah, blah, blah. What do we do? We don't have anything to jump to. We can jump, but what are we going to land on? So we said, well, we're going to move to, we're going to move to Paducah, Kentucky. 
So we moved to Paducah, Kentucky, and we bought a house for $23,000. Wow. And um, and it was, as you might imagine, what a $23,000 house looked like. Um, it wasn't bad, though. Half of it. Yeah. It was a duplex. So we lived in half. We fixed the other half up. And then one day, I like, you know, broke a hole in the wall. So now we have a house. Oh, it's a whole you thing, you know. And my father-in-law was so mad at me. He was like, I can't believe what you've done to my daughter, where you put her. And I'm like, hey, I moved her. She's an hour and a half or two hours closer, so you ought to be Did thankful. you have kids yet? No. Okay. No. Well, see, and that, if you had kids, that had been like all it over it. changes everything. And that's, wouldn't care. that's been the hardest thing to, to balance, I would have to really say, to have the quality of life we want as parents and still do our thing or whatever, you know. But um, we, so, you know, we, we built, we renovated the house, trying to figure out what was going on. Um, you know, we went back and forth with the city of Paducah. I mean, a lot of the people on the city council and the mayor, they were like, oh, this is great. This is what this town needs. Da, da, da. We had our financing lined up and there was just one or two guys on the city council that was like, nah, I don't think so. Oh, I don't see that, it. Isn't that maddening? Just one guy, you know, Yeah. probably woke up that day and was in a bad mood. He's like, nah, you're not going to do your thing. And you think know? of how how much that would have helped. Yeah. That whole yeah. area. Well, and, and that, that mayor has, has stayed, we've stayed friends over the year and he's always kind of shakes his head. He's like, well, you know, I, I can't believe we can't believe we lost out on that, but you know, he, he still supports us and comes to the shows and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, so. that's good. You do draw a lot from, from Padilla. Yeah. So oh yeah. I mean, good. we, that's it's, good. it's definitely like our backyard, you know, they're 30 minutes away or whatever, but. So you guys turned your eyes back towards Kentucky. Well, this is where it gets, this is where you start to look at the serendipity of it all and you go, oh, okay, well then there was a through line to this whole thing. So we lived down on Jefferson Street and you, if those that are hearing this will know, I mean, that's just kind of the main artery coming in and out of, out of town there. So we're walking our dog and we walk back and there's a house for sale. And this all comes back, I promise, I'm not getting <laughs> too far into the weeds here. And, and it's, we'd never seen the house, the sign had just went in the yard. So we just, do we still wanted to move out of our $23,000 house and get a real house someday. You know, I, I said, honey, six months is all we will live in this house. And then I will get you a real house. Okay. And then 10 years later, oh wow, we were still, wow. In that house. wow. <laughs> but I got her a nice one now. We, yeah, we moved she's in patient. The, she's a patient wife. That's one way of saying yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> she hung in there. Right. So we walk into this house, okay, on, on Jefferson. We walk in, and they said, well, who are you kids? And we said, oh, you know, we're Bill and Sarah Minahan. We're trying to start a theater. And he goes, oh, well, my name's Chip Tuller. I own Patty's. Hmm. That's crazy. And he's, an, he's a, a real estate agent. He said it's the only house he's ever listed in Paducah. Huh. He only, and that's the only one he's ever listed since then. And he had just put the sign in the yard minutes ago. Wow. And we walked in there, and he was like, well, well, we'd, we'd like to have a theater in Grand Rivers, but we've never had anybody to run it. And I was like, well, I, I talked to a guy there and they were like, oh, well, yeah, maybe you need to come back over. And I was like, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll come back over. And so, <laughs> so we go back over to talk to some of the, the, the powers that be in town. And we met in a corner of Patty's. It was Chip and this other gentleman who's who uh, the guy that runs Green Turtle Bay, Bill Gary, and me and my wife sitting in a corner. And just about a week ago, a lady walked up to me that was a friend of mine for, for over the years. She goes, I remember when you first came to town. And I was like, oh, really? And she goes, I was your waitress that day. Wow. wow. I was like, I've known you for 15 years and you're just now telling me this? She That's goes, a small town. Yeah. She goes, no, I was your wait. I remember the first day you guys came to town. I remember where you were sitting. And I said, yeah, you know, over in the corner by the front door. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I, I was your waitress that day. Wow. And she's now like Patty's like big, a big wig at Patty's or whatever, but she just remembers that day. So we go through the whole thing and like, we we're like, we're not getting anywhere with this. They're not buying this. We're just going to get a free meal at Patty's and then we'll, we'll go on down our way. And at the end they said, yeah, you know, this looks good. Let's do this. I was like, meaning what? <laughs> like, yeah, well, let's, let's just go ahead with this. Uh -huh. Like we're, well, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Uh, that I mean, I'm not even kidding. Like, it was probably less than that. I was like, well, yeah. So we had to go and, and make this big presentation to the town, to like a, you know, all the, sure. <laughs> everybody in town came and they're it's like. It's a town of 300, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. We, we fit them all in one room with yeah. some despair, you know. And they said, yeah, let's, let's do that. So we broke ground on July 4th of 2005. And you got to build something instead of uh, remodel, exactly. right? Now, and it, this is not a, you know, a, a 
800 seat theater, but it's exactly what we need for exactly what we do. I mean, it's 300 seats. It's 6,000 square feet. Right. It, you know, it's got all the bells and whistles. It's got a great sound system, um, you know, a, a controllable environment, so to speak. And, um, you know, we broke ground on, on July 4th of that year and we did our first show on December 2nd of that year. Wow. Christmas themed. I would say. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. A Christmas themed show. Yeah. But that's, that's how, you know, that's fast. That's real fast. And, you know, I, I sit and look at different projects today going, man, you know, if you really need to get it, I mean, they, they just, okay, where, did you, where did you find contractors who knew how to build? Cause a theater, you know, has, is a, is a specialty. It is, and and that's why we had to be there on a kind of a daily basis and go. Oh, don't don't do that. No, yeah. no, don't do that. No way. You know, like and because they'd never seen our version of a of a theater before. Of course, it's, it's just a box. It's literally a box with seats, and and we we want less. Like they were trying to build walls, but no, 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 take that wall out. And mm-hmm. um, for example, they built us the sound booth. Like they were trying to build it, like you see in the movies, where like there's a glass panel. It's like no, 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 no don't no we. We want to be in the audience. Like the sound booth needs to be in the audience and hear what's. So if anything, we were taking stuff away, not adding to. Right. See, most producers don't have the luxury of being able to build it the way they want, right. and then to be so so aware of every aspect of it. Right. That, that I mean, those shows, like you, when you produce them, I'm sure that you know you know every wrong note, and you can fix, <laughs> you can adjust. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, it's it. It's been a very unique experience from from that standpoint because you know from the outside it just kind of looks like a building you know and then they people come in if anyone's ever like moseying around outside and kind of peeking in and it's not a showdown it's like hey why don't you come inside and they're like oh okay and they come in and their first thing they go oh oh this looks neat we haven't done a we haven't sung a note we haven't done a thing yet but just seeing that creation so to speak of a of a venue like that that from the inside it usually sells the ticket before they even see the show and then you know we hope they like it but um are there are there uh hotels around that um there is a there's one right down the street grand rivers inn there's a bed and breakfast down the road that that patty's owns um called uh rose of the lake and then up on highway 31 is patty's inn and suites they uh, you know that patty's bought it used to be a micro hotel Right. Um, Because we have three hotels. We have a museum right here. I know. Look at me recruiting during the podcast. Exactly. I think we need a theater here. And, you know, we have a theater. Um, you we, do, uh, yeah. So you, um, you, you have the the tornado theater, uh, and that's then you, right. You can expand. <laughs> we could absolutely find some place here absolutely. where we could put we could put a big theater, a big theater. Yeah. Well, you know, on that note, if you think about every small town forever had a movie theater and it was usually a very nice ornate which is what the columbia theater was i'm sure union city i don't know this history but i'm sure there was a movie theater and and it was usually a nice theater so if you if you throw back a hundred years or or less that's commonplace for every place to have its own little theater and and what's interesting is so we have one here called the masquerade and they they do you know performances and um when we first moved here they were doing shrek and so we got to come see Shrek, and we were blown away at the level of talent oh, yeah. and the skill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was. I mean, it was. You didn't expect it. It was very much like equal to what you would see off Broadway, yeah, and in yeah. some cases, yeah. Broadway. Right, right. And so um, we, my wife and I, both have been continually blown away by the level of uh, and the number of people who are in the arts. Right. Who, they may be doing your drywall, right. but then they also write poetry. Or, you know, <laughs> right, they're mowing right. your lawn, right. you know, but they also uh, are in a band. You know? right. So there's a lot of arts that happen in this community that shocks people. Well, and that's actually helped us a ton with Branson because, I mean, one of our trumpet players, Ped Foster, is from Union City. I don't know oh. if, you're, if you're listening, Ped. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he drives down and does, and this guy is a monster trumpet player. And, yeah. you know, and like they said, oh, if you can get that guy, that's pretty awesome. And and we got that guy, you know, he comes down and does shows with us, but he's also a teacher. So we're not under this gun of go, we got to do 12 shows a week to make these people's living and whatever. Very few of them make their living with us alone, but they are talented as such that they could be doing that. They just happen to be a little more normal and have real jobs instead of like only actors or only performers. And so because there's so many people that might hang drywall during the day, but then can come and 
Right. You know, that's been a huge blessing to us because we're like, well, how, how do we even know if we're going to pull this off? Like, yeah, we got a show and there's nobody there, or we got to spend money through the nose to get performers in here. And that's one thing that, that ha- I've had to shift my mentality or my paradigm of Branson mentality versus this. And personally, I mean, pound for pound show wise, I would put our show up now. And I'm, and I mean, I'm not just saying this, but I would put it up against any show that I've ever performed in, in Branson or, you know, uh, on the road or whatever. It's just, we just have gotten, we're just blessed, you know, to have these people, but some of them like Ped has to drive from Union City every time we do a show that he's in, and so and what what are the shows like? What are the what are the main shows that you're doing now? Well, we've had to. We used to have a show called the Variety Music Memories and More Show, and then we went, ooh, we got to have a whole bunch more. So we have every decade is represented. We have a '50s show, a '60s show, '70s show, an '80s show. Um, we have a Sounds of Memphis show. We have different country shows. Um, just because you know we we've got this awesome awesome patron base but there's only x amount of them so instead of you know like branson or like savannah where you you get this turnover like okay in two days all those people are leaving we get a fresh crop in here well we don't we don't have that you know so we have to basically reach out to our folks and get them on a multiple basis um so we don't we really don't repeat much i mean we might for example, maybe the 70s show, like that's one that Ped's in. He plays the horns and that, or plays the trumpet and that. We maybe did that one three or four times this summer. But these guys and girls are so good that like we don't, you know, well, how much do you guys rehearse? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> if you knew, you would be ashamed of us. We, huh. we, we just don't because we don't have the time. But I also have complete trust in these people that I don't have to tell them, hey, you missed a note on that. Or, you know, they know and they'll fix it. And, and they're professionals and they'll take care of it. And so, yeah, we get there an hour before showtime and, you know, go over a few things, but that's, that's about it. And that is, a, that's something we didn't know if we could, that's completely not the Branson mentality or the Branson mode rather. And I, I personally didn't even know if we could do that. And when we rehearsed our first show, we rehearsed it for months and now we'll rehearse a brand new show, maybe two or three times mm. and then do it, you know, but everybody knows their part. They know what's expected of them. And, and they do it, you know, so it, it's, it's crazy, you know, but it's, it's worked so far. <laughs> so you, so you guys started the theater, you got some success, everything's going well, you're, and then all of a sudden there's a fire. Mm-hmm. Um, Patty's um, caught on fire and I don't even know when, I just know there was a I know fire. When. Yeah, I bet you do. So tell us It was about... on my birthday. Oh, and I was out of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was not a good birthday present. It was on my birthday. I was in another country when this happened. As we've, we've got a, a project in Guatemala that we do, and we were there doing some uh, some work, and my wife texts me and says, Patty's um, burned. And I was like, a, a person named Patty? Like, what, what do you mean? Mm. Like, Patty's burned. And I was like, oh, there was a fire? She goes, yeah. And I was like, like a grease fire? Like, what are we talking about? She says, it's gone. And I was like, what? You know, and, and I'm just getting, you know, you might get a text, and then it might 10 minutes later, you know, this, sometimes the connection isn't, isn't great or whatever. And I'm like, Wait, what are you, what are you saying? You know, she's like, it's gone. It's completely gone. And I was like, okay. Which a big part of your business model was, was Patty's. It, it was, it was 90% of our business model. And I mean, the sign on the interstate says Patty's, you know? <laughs> so one, right, yeah, exactly. And I mean, because of what, of what it is that groups want, they want to eat and they want to see something, a show or whatever. Like you take one of those away and, and that, you know, for years, Patty was like, Patty said, we need a show here. We need you guys to be here. Right. And we fit that bill perfectly. And they said, oh, you know, we can see our businesses. It's helped our business. Um, we're able to offer something. Groups can come in and do da da da, you know, whatever. Well, now we're like the converse of that, you know, um, and I don't, there's a, a business book a few years ago called The Black Swan, mm-hmm. you know, and the guy talked about the one thing that could go wrong that nobody ever thought of. And that was it. I mean, nobody ever. I mean. And what started the fire? Do they know? It, it was just some in the, you know, the, the old building was kind of a hodgepodge of different buildings gotcha. put together. So it might have been a, an electrical or something. Um, you know, they got it out relatively quickly, but the the damage was done. And then when it came time to rebuild it, um, 
part of it was still standing, but it was, you know, the contractor who was a, a guy that we had known from another um, thing had said, you know, it was going to be cheaper for me to build new than to try to fix the old one. But then they had trouble getting the, with the insurance company and getting the, you know, the money to tear that one down. And be, it, so it was, there was just a big process. Um, so they, I think they broke ground later, later that year, but it's, it's been a challenge, you know, for, for them to, to basically redo what was there, but it's, the what's going to be new is going to be unbelievable. I mean, and when when is that going to open? They they're really they're anticipating like late October is okay. is kind of what they're saying. Um, okay. You know, it'll be a, it'll be a challenge just like anything to get up and running, and because that is really that is really our main season. I mean, Christmas quote unquote starts the first week in November around there yeah. and goes right up to Christmas. Right. You know, which is which is good for us from a business model, but. On the other hand, you know, it's it's going to be a challenge for us because last year we were kind of going along and I was like, well, you know, we're we're not falling off too bad. You know, it's okay. And we're down a little bit. Then we got to Christmas. And if if a group can't do the whole package, I mean, it's like saying you're going to Disneyland, but when you get to that ride, you're just going to sit in a car and watch a movie or something. You know, it's mm-hmm. like that's part of the experience is sitting in patties and the amazing surroundings and the amazing food. And then, Oh, that's over. Now let's walk across the street to the theater. Oh, we saw a great show. Let's get back on the bus and take our little to go box and let's go back to wherever we're from. And and we're in our own bed by seven o'clock or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is great. Well, that just isn't going to happen anymore. And so, or, you know, until, until they're back. And the amazing thing to me was that, that anyone showed up at that point, because you look out there and you're like, wow, there's nobody in town, but there's a crowd of a you know 150, 200 night. They all got in their car and drove here and watched our show and then got in their car and drove home for no other reason. Yeah, that's and that, amazing. That's saying a lot. And we so now I always say this thing at the end of the show, like, look, I know you could have been anywhere you wanted to be tonight, but you chose to be with us, and for that we are very thankful. And we never take our audiences for granted. But I just want to say, you know, the the audience that stuck with us these last couple of years has you know, basically allowed us to hold on until, you know, brighter days ahead, you know. Well, I'm 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 gonna come before. I'm not gonna wait Good, till Patty okay. till Patty's. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I can stop on the way. I and mean, there's lots of places exactly, to eat on the way. Exactly. So, so I, it's right. it's absolutely my wife and I are gonna do that. You mentioned Guatemala. Mm-hmm. Um tell me a little bit about your uh mission and your ministry that you have there. That's really interesting. Well, it was it was one of those, you know, I, I did go to a Bible college. I have a degree in, in cross cultural missions, and then I always joke I, I ended up in the Godforsaken entertainment business <laughs> and really kind of <laughs> and I and I don't know how exactly. I just kind of there I was one day. I was like, wow, I'm doing shows and guys that <clears throat> that I went to college with, you know, that are like ministers of big churches, they're like, What are you doing? And I was like, oh, I, I do, I, I sing in this show. And they're like, you sing? And I was like, eh, a little bit. And they're like, I, you know, their wheels are trying to compute. And they're just like, oh, okay, um, good for you, I guess. You know, so my whole life, I'm like, well, I guess I didn't really do that. I got this degree in ministry or whatever. Well, then um, my wife and I go on a uh, on a cruise uh, down to the Caribbean, one of these little three day cruises, and they said, uh, "Well, do you want to go back into the jungle and see the such and such school?" And I was like, ah, "That sounds pretty cool. We'll pay the forty bucks and ride these little boats back into the nothing." And um, this is over in the eastern part of Guatemala, and I get over there and I come out and it's it's a school like little kids running around. In, in blue jeans and white pressed shirts and backpacks and perfectly combed hair in thatched roof huts. And they're going to school and they're carrying like computer bags. And I mean, I'm like, this does not compute, does not compute, you know. And it just, I mean, to this day, I don't know. Again, it goes back to like the guy, you know, Patty's that said, I only, you know, the guy from Patty's that said, I only listed one house ever in Paducah and you came to that house that night and that's how we met, you know? So I'm, I'm sitting here in Guatemala, you know, 45 minutes into the jungle from the sea. And I see this like school and I, I, you know, I just, I just started, I mean, like, like ugly crying, like, you know, like, and, and my wife finally said, okay. Cause we were with like a bunch of tourists. We're walking around this school and she said, you need to like pull it together and wrap it up because whatever you're freaking everybody out like bad and I mean I was doing the <laughs> you know and and not even knowing why and having having no desire to do anything or whatever 
Um, so the, the long story short is, you know, I, we came back, I tried to get involved. We brought one of their teachers over and put him through Murray state. And, and I say that took, that was what, $12,000 to bring a kid over and do that. And we raised all that money through the theater. We did fundraisers. And what, what really hit me that day was, okay, here is how I can still be involved in something like a ministry type thing. And I thought that I had gone off the deep end by being in this theater world thing or whatever. And I, you know, I was still felt like it was my calling, but I was like, what in the world? Like, how did I get over here and over here and that nothing matches or whatever? And it all matched instantaneously because I saw that we had a platform to present needs to 30,000 people a year. And I was like, Oh, and, and that wasn't even something I pondered on. I wonder if maybe if we did. It was like an instantaneous understanding of like, oh, okay, we have this, and that will equate to this, and da da da. da. So I mean, like, it wasn't. I wouldn't say easy, but we very, you know, without too much difficulty, raised twelve thousand bucks to put this kid through Murray State and send him back. Um, then I went back over and I said, all right, let's let's do something else, you know. So we. Um, we got we went way up to the northern part of Guatemala where they needed a um, a school, and we built a we built an eight room school up there that was like forty thousand U S dollars raised every penny of it from you know from from our patrons I mean every penny of it so it wasn't like and and that you know at a hundred bucks a pop or fifty bucks a pop or this or that you know, forty thousand dollars I was like wow that's that's pretty cool. But, and this is nice, but we might be done here. This is, we had our little thing. This is great. We're driving back to the airport from that project. And the guy's like, I want to show you guys something. And we pull into this village where there's, there's 22 families sleeping in tents. And I'm like, oh, that's unfortunate. They said, oh yeah, their whole village got destroyed by a tropical storm Agatha or I think whatever her name was, you know, (laughs) Um, she she was not kind to them, whatever her name was. Um, and they don't have any houses or a school. Oh boy! So and there's a guy with us who's did one you of, start ugly crying then? No, I actually started going. Oh great! <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah. Like I yeah. thought I was out, and yeah. you pulled me back in. Yeah. And one of the guys with us was a patron. He starts ugly crying. <laughs> <laughs> he goes. He goes. Bill. Um. I'm in, I'm in, I'll give whatever money it takes to rebuild this city. And, and like everyone in the room is going like, stop, stop, stop. You know, cause he's saying it in front of the other people, like the, the town, the, the people in the village. It's like, don't, don't promise them that. And he's like, no, I'm good for it. I'm good for it. And he, he was, I, I know the guy, he's definitely good for it. You just don't say that in front of him. He's like, you know, full out, ugly, bawling, cry. Never saw this guy, guy cry before or since, you know? And he's like, we're going to do this. <sighs> All right, here we go. So anyway, we um, we decided to do it, and a hundred and sixty thousand dollar project this time. Wow! This guy, and he would kill me if I ever said his name, so I won't. But uh, I mean, he himself probably put in about fifty thousand dollars. Wow! And and then he went to all his rich friends and says, "Hey, wouldn't you like to?" I mean, we built twenty two homes and a school there. Wow! In in the course of about two years. And he'd go to his rich friends and say, hey, wouldn't you like to build a house in Guatemala? And that's going to cost you $5,000. And they were like, uh, I guess so. But how much How much good $5,000 is doing for those people? Oh, it, it's incredible. It's a three-bedroom house over yeah. there. You yeah. know, sadly, I'm building our house. You know, I got her out of the $23,000 house, right? Yeah. So now we're, we're I'm building our house in Marshall County, and my retaining wall was $5,000. Right. Oh, exactly. You know, yeah. and, I, and I'm building that and writing those checks and feeling really bad about it. But I'm like, well, okay, it all, I guess, balances out. But so we... We did that, and you know he was the primary fundraiser. You know, like that was his kind of like ugly crying moment that made him go to the next stage. And then we got that done, and I'm like, okay, we're we're good now, right? We're done, right? So I had still been thinking in my mind that I wanted to do an ongoing project, an ongoing school or whatever, and I, I don't know. And then we, and I'll. We can keep this in. It, it, it is kind of hard for me to talk about, but we lost a daughter about, uh, well, about four years ago. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of in that phase where we were, we were done with Guatemala, but we, we lost a, a little girl at, at 20 weeks, and her name was Ava Grace. Mm-hmm. And 
and as I, as we're kind of dealing with that, you know, everyone deals with grief in their own way. And my way was to do something, you know, mm-hmm. to be, to be proactive or whatever. And I, we were kind of done with Guatemala at that point, not in a bad way, but just like, well, we completed that or whatever. So I said, let's, let's start a school there that will keep going and we'll name it after her. And so there in Chimaltenango, Guatemala, there's a, there's a school called Grace English School. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's, we're in our third year. Um, it's completely licensed by the, you know, by the Guatemalan government. It's a full fledged uh, school. The interesting thing or the unique thing is that the kids are spoken to in English all day long, every day. Like, you know, so your average kid, maybe here in the States that gets thrown into a class and they don't speak the language. Well, they, they catch on pretty quick. Or, right. And so these kids are like, well, starting in kindergarten, you're going to be spoken to in English all day long. And I'm over there a couple of years ago and my son's in kindergarten and I'm with the kindergartners and I'm like, they're doing the same stuff. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're on the level <laughs> with, with these kids. Like they know their colors. They know their numbers, just like kindergartners in the States. Yeah. So they're getting an unbelievable education over there. The ability to speak English is equivalent or greater than the ability to, or than having a college degree. I mean, because there's plenty of people with college degrees that don't have work over there. But if you're fluent in English, you go to the front of the line. Right. You know, right. So, oh, absolutely. That's great. I mean, I was on um, I was online with one of the teachers. This is just about a week ago. And we were we were working on working with a kid here in the States on some math because he was falling behind. He's a Spanish speaking kid. And I and I looked behind her on the board and she and it was third grade. And I said, is that third grade math? And she said, yeah, that's for the third graders. And I was like. Holy cow! I would. I don't know that. <laughs> that's math that I don't know that I could do. I mean, it was. Yeah. It's. It's a high level. I mean, they're getting a high level education over there, and it's. It's ongoing. I mean, we luckily got a, a large grant from the Carson Meyer Foundation to basically underwrite the, the majority of it. You know, um, but then we do fundraisers and and everything. And luckily, we had had that experience of doing all the other fundraisers that I felt like, well, I, we can, we can do this, you know, yeah. we can accomplish this or whatever. So, so you're, you're doing what a lot of people around here do. You have a lot of side hustles going on. You have a lot of <laughs> irons in the fire, right, right, you're, right, you know, right. you're connecting, you know, which, which both my wife and I, who, you know, have only been here for a year are both loving, you know, all the different things you can do. Yeah, I mean, you everybody's can, got something going on. Right. You got, you yeah. know, your job, you got a hundred ball, balls in the air. Right. Um, before we get out of here though, you and I have to talk about our mutual Mutual friend, yes. friends, uh, Terry, Mike, and Debbie Jeffries. Yes, um, Terry, Mike Jeffries is is not only a talented entertainer, but what a great guy! A great guy. So you get to work with him. How, how did how does Terry work at your theater? He's he's there in probably every almost every show. I mean, he's probably in eighty percent of our shows. I mean, but here's what's great about Terry, Mike Jeffrey. I mean, I went last January, two years, Januarys ago. He's on stage with Priscilla Presley. Mm-hmm. You know, with the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. And then two days later, he's singing in a gospel show at our theater, and he's fine to be the guy over in the corner playing the piano. Yeah. No, you he's know? humble. He's oh. he's talented. Oh. I've had him on, on uh, booked him on cruise ships yeah. for the shows for yeah. that. Yeah. He's done so many shows for us, and every one of them, you know, are just incredible. Um, you'll have to ask him about the um, we all all the people in the Elvis world who went on this Elvis cruise yeah. during a hurricane. We call oh. it the Hurra Cruise. So you'll have to ask <laughs> Terry awesome. Mike. Yeah, the Hurra Cruise. Yeah, we ended up um, and and Terry Mike and I got to spend a lot of time together on this particular cruise and his beautiful and talented wife as well. But we were uh, the because of the hurricane, the cruise ship had to go further out. So we ended up being like at sea for like three more days than oh, we intended wow. to be. And so you couldn't have picked two people to be better to be oh, with. For absolutely. We also had about, you know, maybe 10 Elvis tribute artists. We had some Imperial entertainment. Wasn't a problem. We, we had exactly. And so, because, <laughs> you know, the shows that had been planned, you know, we needed more. So we had to go to all the entertainers and say, okay, guys, we got a stage. We've got musicians. Right. Let's put on some shows. What you going to do? Yeah. And a lot of people said they liked the second part of the cruise better than the first part. <laughs> the we, cruise part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had so much fun, you know, but I, I, um, I think a lot of Terry, Mike and his whole family. Well, you know, the, for us, we kind of joke, like the funnest part of the show is like before the show begins, us hanging around backstage and goofing around and laughing. Oh, come on, guys, it's seven. We got to go. You know, we got to go do a show, you know. And he's just, I've noticed in my life, this like in the magic world, when you meet different people that are higher up the food chain, like the the, the ones that have kind of made it and, and 
they don't have to put on airs and they don't have to brag and name drop and whatever. He's just he's just who he is, mm-hmm. you know? And it's been so, um, I mean, he and I were just chatting this morning actually on the way up here and I, and I told him we were coming. So we were talking about some other stuff and I'm like, man, he's just a great guy and he's so encouraging. So if, if you do something good in a show, I mean, in, in the old days, I I've noticed this, the older, the older we all get, you don't really want to tell that person how great they were because you know, that might somehow take away from your star shining a little bit or something, you know, but now we're all just like, oh man, you that was awesome. And him especially, like I'll never forget, I did something one time and we it was kind of in like an acoustic set of a of a show. And I did something and I remember him going, That was fantastic. Like and he kind of said it into the into the mic and it, you know, and everything. But I was like, man, that meant more to me hearing him say that. And it maybe it, it wasn't anything spe- special, but he was just encouraging, you know, like, oh man, you do that song. I know that one song in the '60s show. You do that really well. I love the way you do that. I'm yeah, that's incredible. That. You know, he didn't have to do that. You know, now my my son will tell you, my my seven year old son, that Terry, Mike, and Debbie have the greatest pool in the world because that's oh. where my son goes and goes swimming. Oh, nice. Yes, and so about two weeks ago, we go over there, and Debbie, his lovely wife, as you said, has like treats spread out for us. She has towels. She has grapes. She has three different kinds of drinks. <laughs> and she said, now before you leave, don't, rem- don't forget, we're going to go buy the, we're going to go buy the deep freeze and we're all going to get uh, ice cream on the way out. And I'm like, yeah, yeah oh, you know? that's nice. And they're just yeah. the sweetest people. And, and we, we pulled out of there and my son goes, he goes, they are just the nicest people. And I said, yeah. And one other time he goes, do you think, um, sometime we could go over there and spend the night. <laughs> and I said, well, honey, I don't think that's how that works. So we'll just go swim over there. And he's like, okay, well, I just thought they're kind of like grandma to me. So I, I, I thought maybe we'd go over and spend the night. With oh, them. that's all. I know they would. They love that <laughs> oh, story. They would totally sure. do that. They yeah. would totally do that. Yeah, they but, would love that. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah. and doing this with us. Well, and you know, one last thing that I yeah. want to just, as I'm walking in today, I think about, you know, your founders and what their vision allowed this area you know this whole region to have and my wife and i've been talking a lot lately about like our legacy like what what are we going to leave behind i mean obviously our kids we want to leave a good we want to leave good kids behind us because that's a legacy in and of itself but i mean just i just am so encouraged by this place because every time we come here it's like this didn't have to be here Mm -hmm. it's not required to be here but probably shouldn't be you know it it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense just like you know a brand center Mm -hmm. like you know a show working in grand rivers with 300 people like it doesn't make sense but it works because of somebody's vision that was willing to say this needs to happen and the older i get the more i'm appreciative of of that because there was a couple of guys like the the guy that you know was telling you that was that gave the 50,000. I mean, he's been such an inspiration to me in my life to kind of give without really knowing what the end result is to kind of almost give beyond your means, knowing that it's all going to work out. And this place is just, you know, I hope that people around here, I hope that people listening realize the, what the legacy is of this place and of, of the founders, because they had a vision that probably only they had. I would assume, you know, I would assume. Yeah. And, and, this is here. Like this is a this is a thing. Now everything you see anywhere is started because someone thought about it. And what's interesting about this place is similar to putting together a show or a theater mm-hmm. or what you know the things mm-hmm. that you do. Uh, when Robert Kirkland had the vision for this place, mm-hmm. he put the call out to the community, and mm-hmm. the community came together. Um, the, the when he said, "I'm going to be at the library to talk about this," 250 people showed up. Wow! And so they divided the room up into sections. Wow. And if you were interested in science, you went here. If you're interested in dinosaurs, you went here. Awesome. And those became the committees. And the committees really worked hard to put together what this place should be. Mm-hmm. And only then did he take it to the museum professionals. So, oh, wow. Um, it, so this is what we want. It really is envisioned by, you know, he started it and then he really did pull the community together. Right. So this whole thing, you know, is community devised, just right. like, you know, took the skills of a lot of people. So Right, right. Well, and you, you really have to i mean like even like with this uh you know the guatemala thing i mean we've got uh local teachers that are working there or we've got actually our director is from kentucky but but you know she's empowered to go and do her thing she doesn't get a, a directive from me like you will do da, 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 da. you know you have to empower the people and those that are in charge of the creation or the running of and say all right this is my vision now you run with the ball and that's what's i mean yeah and you guys 
it's it's unbelievable the the level of you know everything you guys do here and the professionalism and i mean we just came and did hot wheels you know a couple weeks ago or a week ago whatever and i was like that's something you'd see in chicago or something you'd see in a big city somewhere and it's right here and we're so we're so blessed to have you all and maybe you know sometimes you all you know you come to work every day and this is what you do but you know from from an outsider looking in i just want to you know kudos to you all and especially to your founder and to your founders for um you know their vision and that's what that's really what makes the world go around, especially when it comes to kind of like things artistic or things in the creative. You really have to have someone that says, you know, this is important enough that we're going to do this. And, yep. and then this, you may or may not ever know what the ripple effects are. Someone might see this and go, oh, I want to do this. And then that happens. It's exactly right. A lot of times kids visit here and it's the first time they've ever been on an escalator. And so you start from there, then, then <laughs> exactly. they get to do Hot Wheels or, right. you know, and I always, you know, think about how many scientists or engineers or mathematicians or, and that you'll you never know, know that the seeds are getting planted just mm-hmm. like the little tiny bill got, right. you know, got the, <laughs> got, got the three little pigs, got yeah. that little seed planted, yeah, yeah. you know, who knows what, what good, you know, is coming of this place. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, the world will Will be a better place because of absolutely it. and now andrew gibson is taking us behind the scenes at discovery park of america to see what we may be able to discover today thank you scott i am andrew gibson with the education department here at discovery park of america and today i'm with carl Ulrich, who is a docent here, um, who last time he was on the episode or on, on the podcast talked about uh, firehouses and the kind of the history behind the firehouses. Uh, so continuing that theme, he's going to talk to us more and share some very interesting stories. Uh, so Carl, uh, take it away. Well, I thought I would discuss uh, pertaining to history of the fire service a little bit about how one would call 911 before anybody had gotten around to inventing the telephone. Uh, obviously, 911 is also a modern invention, but how would you contact the fire department before before telephone was invented? So the obvious initial solution was to send a runner to the fire station, wherever the closest one happened to be. And that has uh, limited utility because in a large city where you have multiple fire stations, how do you know, how do you communicate with the other stations that, hey, this fire is more than we can handle. We need more help. So in the 1840s and 50s, when... Uh, the telegraph was being invented, someone started thinking along the lines of, hey, this might not be a bad idea. We could probably adapt this technology to make a fire alarm system to communicate through a municipality. Uh, The first person to do that successfully was a guy named Dr. William Channing, who was an itinerant dentist. Um, And the technology was so new that anybody who was a hobbyist could get involved in in that. And so he did. And he invented the first practical system, and that was installed in Boston, Massachusetts in 1851. And so he had a telegraph apparatus that, that was placed on various street corners in the city. And the residents would go, and they would pull the alarm hook to activate it, and that would send a telegraph signal to the fire stations and alert them to which box that was. So the boxes were coded. Each one had a unique number, and so the firefighters would look at their map and say, well, that's box number one, and that's at the intersection of, you know, fill in the blank. And so they would know where to respond. So along came a guy named John Nelson Gamewell, and he also was I was probably more of an entrepreneur than an inventor. And he saw this idea and said, hey, this is fantastic. I'm going to get rich off of this deal. So he wound up buying the rights to that system from Channing. And his name uh, and the company that bears his name became synonymous with fire alarm systems. Uh, that company is actually still around today. So he... Not only he made some improvements to the system, but like a lot of companies, uh, became so powerful that when people would come along and make improvements to this technology, rather than try to compete against him, they would just sell out to him. And so his empire got bigger and bigger. So we don't see a lot of these fire alarm boxes in our area in, uh, in the southern states. It's more of a or more commonly found today in New England and perhaps on the West Coast, and they're less common today than they, they used to be. So the, the way these things work, obviously there's one on every street corner or approximately every street corner, and sometimes on major buildings or factories, and each box has its own unique number, and that tells the firefighters which map 
or where on the map they need to go to. And so it would actually, the uses a clockwork mechanism, initially weight driven, but then later on spring wound, an actual clockwork. Uh, and so when you pull the hook to activate that alarm, it would tap out the code of whatever number corresponded to that box. So if you had box 11, that's a one and a one. So it sound in the firehouse, something like a boxing ring gong. And there would be a rent, there would be a bell in every room or, or close enough to every room in a firehouse where everybody could hear that. So the, the boxes would be numbered sequentially, although, and you could do a zero, so you could have a box 10. It would be a one gong followed by 10 gongs. Well, that's not very practical because it takes a long time to tap out 10 gongs. You could actually tap out a one, 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 one faster than you could a one zero or a one ten in, in that case. And so very often the box numbers aren't pure, you know, truly sequential because they would leave out all the high digits just to save time. Uh, so in a city where you had multiple fire stations, you ha- that next begs the question of how do you know who goes to this fire? You can't all go to one fire because you have to continue coverage throughout the city. So every station had what were called run cards in a file that somebody was assigned to keep track of. And when a gong would sound, they would count the alarms, count, count the count the strikes, figure out which box that was, and they go to the run card. It would That run card would show the address of that box, the box location, and it would tell which engine companies, ladder companies, chief officers, uh, and rescue companies might be responding to that when that alarm sounded. And so a typical response would be two or three engines and a ladder truck plus a fire chief for a typical fire. So let's assume that they respond to that fire, they get there, and the chief says, yeah, this is more than we can handle with the assignment that we have here. I need more help. He would then go or have somebody go back to that box and and tap out on a telegraph key that was located inside that box twice to indicate this is a second alarm and then pull the hook again. So when that number came back through the alarm office and the firehouses would say, hey, this is a second alarm at this location. So then they'd go back to their run cards and see, well, who is the second on the second alarm assignment? So there may be an additional three engines and two ladders and an additional chief officer on a second alarm and so on, all the way up to fifth alarm. And there are a few communities that did alarm systems or, or uh, methods of operation with alarm systems where they would have more than five, five alarms, but that's kind of unusual. Typically, you would say a fifth alarm or perhaps a fifth and greater, meaning it was everybody was coming to that fire. So another aspect of that is when you have multiple alarms and everybody's going to this fire, that's going to leave a pretty good swath of the city uncovered in a larger geographical area. And so there would be additional move-up assignments. So you might not be responding to a fire on a second alarm or a third alarm, but you might have to move to a different station to cover that territory in case other fires happened. And in a big city where you were worried about conflagrations, that did happen. So fire brands would would be uh, lifted up by the heat column in the smoke, and the wind would carry it somewhere several blocks away and start a new fire on the rooftops. So you you couldn't eliminate your fire coverage uh, by putting everybody on one fire, you had to have people scattered throughout that area. So my mom makes this dish called Five Alarm Chili. Uh, so is that where we get the name for that from? It is. So we kind of use that uh, to send, um, to indicate something that's exceptionally hot. So Five Alarm chi- Chili should be pretty hot. So we have emergency phones here at the park, which I don't advise people pulling them. Um, but we do have something that you you can uh, kind of get your hands on. Uh, and Carl, can you can you tell us about that? Yes. And in front of our firehouse, we do have one of these Gamewell alarm boxes. It's a 1951 series three-fold master box is the technical name for that. And uh, anyway, it is not actually hooked up to the alarm system. So it is something that our guests are invited to come and experience. So you can pull that hook and sound that alarm without actually getting a citation for turning in a false alarm. You guys heard it here from Carl. Thank you all for listening to Rule Foot Forward, a West Nancy podcast. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America, where we pride ourselves in those hands-on experiences, just like the fire alarm. And we hope to see you here real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. 
Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.